Welcome back, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one of those nights because my guest tonight is one of my favorite musicians of all time and probably yours. He has 16 Grammys and is a two-time Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee. He's now the subject of a new docuseries called In Restless Dreams about his life and his latest album, Seven Psalms. You know, it's not like a thought that I actually even enjoy. You know, I don't like to think, oh, this is the theme of this. I like to work and then discover. Let me just see if I want this inversion. People say, why is it that you always want to change your sound? And I'm not thinking that way at all. I'm looking for the edge of what you can hear. I can just about hear it, but I can't quite. But that's the thing I want. Uh, now, how do you get there? You know, it's a, it's a travel because it's, it's way on the horizon. And sometimes you find it to make something that has magic, you know? Please welcome back to The Late Show, Paul Simon. Nice very to have kind, you back. Thank you for being here. You. Thank you. Oh, they're very kind people. But, um, Paul, uh, welcome back to New York. Do you get to spend much time in the city? Uh, not as much as I used to, but, um, yeah, I'm here um, three, four months out of the year. Okay. We'll take the Paul Simon we can get. <laughs> and it's lovely to see Thanks. you again. I so enjoyed Alice Gibney's documentary. I saw the first part uh, of In Dreams last night and then interviewed you over the Directors Guild about it. What, what I love about it is it has much the same reaction that I had when I was watching Peter Jackson's documentary of the Beatles and, and their process, is that I love seeing a great artist who I admire going through the process of creating their material to see how they got to this thing that moved me so. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about your life. It's about uh, the first part of your career with your old partner, Art. And, but about that process, and, and, and one of the things that you say can sort of continually in this documentary is that I noticed a big compliment from you is, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, you're interested in things that interest you. So what was the first song you ever heard and you thought, that's interesting? Well, my, uh, I know exactly what it was. Uh, I didn't think that's interesting, but I'll tell you exactly what it was. When I was 12, I was a big Yankee fan and I used to do a score, score the ball games. You know, sure. you fill out the lineup and you could indicate this is a base hit, base on ball, strike sure. one. So before the Yankee games, there was a show on called, I think it was called Make Believe Ballroom, but I'm not sure. Okay. And they played pop music and it was, I just wanted to be there on time for the Yankee games and the music was so boring, it wasn't interesting. <laughs> uh, and as I'm filling out, you know, Yogi Berra, you know, the DJ says, I got this record in this morning, and this has to be the worst thing I've ever heard. If this record is a hit, I'll eat my hat. And he plays a record called G by the Crows, which you probably never heard of. No, no. Earlier R&B song, it uh, goes, uh, Whoa, whoa, G, oh, 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 G, 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 how I love that girl. And I'm thinking, that's the first thing I've heard on there that I had it liked at all. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really the first time I guess I ever heard rock and roll. Wow. What year is that? So maybe 54. In the documentary, you say that you're trying to explain to your dad, who was a musician, what was <laughs> great about this music, and you try to explain to him sort of the, the, the feeling you get when you hear the lyric, Earth Angel. Right. I was, my father was a very good musician, and he comes from an era of really sophisticated music, big bands, and, you know, uh, Sinatra, and uh, 
the Dorsey brothers and uh, just great, great, great musicians. So he wasn't interested in, in, uh, in this rock and roll, but there was a song, it was a big hit called Earth Angel mm -hmm. uh, by the Penguins. It was a big, big hit. So I'm explaining to him, I'm 13. No, but dad, look at this. The song is called Earth Angel. You, you get it? Earth Angel. <laughs> An Earth Angel. You know? You know? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't buy it? He didn't buy it, but I love that record. Uh, to, to this day, I love that record. Well, you, you name checked the Penguins and the Moon yeah, Bros and, right. the, and the Five Satins in right. Renee and George at Magritte with a dog after the war. That's right. And the Orioles. That's the right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You say that when you're writing a, a song, you know, um, you consider the sound, the music, before the lyrics. The music comes first. Okay. Have you ever been surprised by the direction of the lyrics as you wrote them? Yes. Yeah, that happens. Well... Like you think you're I, writing one thing and then at a certain point you go, oh, wait, this isn't the song I thought? Um, yes, that happens. There's a song... There's a song. It's one of my favorite songs. It's, it's not really very well known. It's called Darling Lorraine, mm -hmm. which um, was also the name of a doo-wop song, which I took... I like that song. So here's... <laughs> Can I is it, recite some lyrics? I hope you will. Okay, so, so the song begins uh, in a way that I often begin when I really don't know what I'm going to say. The song begins like, the first time I saw her, I couldn't be sure, uh, but the sin of temptation said, she's just what you're looking for. I really have no idea where I'm going, you know? So I walk right up to her, and with the part of me that talks, I introduce myself as Frank from New York, New York. So this, is, this to me, is like an internal joke because anybody from New York, they never say they're from New York, New York. You know, says, <laughs> I'm from New York. No, oh, I'm from Schenectady, New York. But no, no, I'm from New York. You know, so he's introducing himself as from New York, New York. So I immediately think, I don't know that Frank is going to be all that honest as a guy. We'll see. She's, then he goes on, she's so hot, she's so cool, I'm not. I'm just a fool in love with darling Lorraine. So a fool in love is like a cliche that we've heard in tons of songs. So it's fine with me. I like a cliche in the beginning. But now I begin the second verse, and what I'm singing, just out of uh, subconscious, is uh, all my life I've been a wanderer. And then I think, that's enough cliches, so I go, all my life, I've been a wanderer. Not really. I mostly lived in my parents' home. Anyway, Lorraine and I got married. <laughs> Lorraine and I got married on the usual marriage stuff. And then one day, she says to me from out of the blue, Frank, I've had enough. Romance is a heartbreaker, and I'm not meant to be a homemaker, and I'm tired of being darling Lorraine. What? You don't love me anymore? What? You're walking out the door? What? You don't like the way I chew? Hey, let me tell you, you're not the woman I wed. You say you're depressed, but you're not. You just like to stay in bed. I don't need you, darling Lorraine. Lorraine, Lorraine, I long for your love. <laughs> so after he says this, then he's then. He's embarrassed, he changes the subject. Financially speaking, <laughs> I guess I'm a washout. Everything is buy and sell and sell and buy, and that's what the whole thing's all about. And if it had not been for Lorraine, I'd have left here long ago. I should have been a musician. I love the piano. She's so light, she's so free. I'm tight, but that's me. But I feel so good with darling Lorraine. Then the song changes to another section, and it says, on Christmas morning, Frank awakes to find Lorraine has made a stack of pancakes. They watch the television, husband and wife, all afternoon, it's a wonderful life. You know, pun on, mm -hmm, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't love me anymore? 
What, you're walking out the door? What, you don't like the way I chew? Hey, let me tell you, you're not the woman that I wed. Give me my robe. I'm going back to bed. I'm sick to death of you, Lorraine. And as soon as I wrote that line, I said, oh my God, Lorraine is, Lorraine's gonna die. So the next verse is, uh, darling Lorraine, uh, her hands like wood. The doctor was smiling, but the news wasn't good. The news wasn't good. Darling Lorraine, please don't leave me yet. I know you're in pain, pain you can't forget. Your breathing is like a memory of our love. Maybe I'll go down to the corner store and buy us something sweet. Here's an extra blanket, honey, to wrap around your feet. All the trees were washed with April rain, and the moon in the meadow took darling Lorraine. Thank you. So that song had two like changes of directions. One where I said, oh, you could just change the subject, you know? All my life I've been a wanderer. Eh, not really. I mostly lived in my parents' home. Anyway. Wow. Um, How often does your own song surprise you? You said at one point in the documentary that I like or last it if night, it does. What'd you say? I like it if it does. You said at a certain point, like 60% into creating a song, sometimes the song will then start to show you the path. Yeah, what is it like when it doesn't? Well, you just, it's not complete, you know. You do you throw it away or do you put it in a drawer? Seldom. Don't put it in a drawer. I have thrown a couple of songs away where I've said, after I wrote a lyric, you know what? That's bull I don't, know. <laughs> I, don't be I don't believe, I don't believe that. Can we talk for a second about the 59th Street Bridge song because- Just for a second. Okay. <laughs> is that people love that song. You know, slow down, you move too fast. That for the people who don't know, it's feeling groovy. Um, why? People love that song. It's a youthful song. Yes, but why do you not like to do it anymore? No, I loathe that song. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so, sometimes in shows, if I made an error in some other song, I would sing that song as punishment. <laughs> No, here's, here's what it is. I come up to the line and I just don't want to sing, life, I love you, all is groovy. You know, I, say, oh, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> you, don't you don't love life? I don't want to sing it. Okay. I'm fine, I'm You'd fine. You'd rather do it. Yeah, I'm fine okay. with life, yeah. You know, everybody's got their favorite Paul Simon songs and I've already named a few of my favorite here in this interview, but I'm, I, I like, I've asked uh, several other great artists this. Um, you have to do one set, uh, this is the this is the Paul Simon set in your opinion. Five songs. What is it? Well, when I do a five, I, I'm about to do a five song set actually uh, at the White House I'm at a dinner. Thud. But <laughs> I'm sorry. Where uh, I didn't hear that. Where was that? <laughs> <laughs> the songs I'm picking are the ones that are most familiar. They're not necessarily the like my list of what I'd most like to do. Well, that's what I would like to know, is like, if you were playing for Paul Simon, if you know what I mean, like, oh, if you're okay. your own audience here, what are you playing for Paul Simon? I would play as up-tempo songs, Graceland. Uh, <laughs> me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Yeah. See, you like that one? Uh, maybe late in the evening. Sure. Uh, or, Mother and Child Reunion. And for ballads, I would play The Sound of Silence. The Boxer, I like. It's a quality song. Or even uh, Still Crazy After All These Years. So. Um, amazing artists, uh, Johnny Cash, Aretha Franklin, many others have covered your songs. Do you have a favorite or unexpected cover? Well, my favorite cover is Aretha's, but the unexpected one that became one of my favorites was uh, 
I should start this off by saying I was never a Frank Sinatra fan. I, it's before my time. It's, I wasn't interested in the American songbook. Now I revere it and Frank Sinatra. But anyway, I wasn't a fan. And in the 60s, he did a cover version of Mrs. Robinson, you know, which... I've never heard that. You've never heard it? I've never heard his version, no. Well, no, it wasn't... Uh, he didn't set the charts on fire with that, but... <laughs> but anyway, I, I hear it, and he's singing... Uh, so ring-a-ding-ding, Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> Jilly loves you more than you will know. And wine is fine as I am can only see. Ring, you know. And so I say, hey, he can't do that. <laughs> That's. That, no, nobody asked my permission. I'm stopping the record. <laughs> so they say, really? You want to stop a Frank Sinatra record? I say, I don't care. Yeah, and you can't, you don't do that. So a couple of days later, I get a phone call from some guy at Warner Brothers saying, look, please don't do this. I said it was OK to do this. Don't make me go to Frank and... <laughs> <laughs> and Knuckles. Yeah, so I, I said, oh, OK. The song became I Love It Now. It's the, it's the record that I play as soon as the concert's over, because it's perfect Rat Pack. Lyrics, it's, and it's, I love it, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, uh, not in the way I love Aretha Franklin's thing, which is glorious, but it's so funny. <laughs> One of my favorite songs. <laughs> One of my favorite songs of yours is Slip Sliding Away. Mm -hmm, and, uh, uh, can you tell me about writing that? Like, what was the process like for that? Because it's got beautiful structures, a man, a woman, a father, you know, God, the, the different points of view of these different uh, personages. Well, the thing that I remember most about that is it's, it's probably the song that I wrote most quickly. I think it came in less than a half an hour. It just wow. came out. That's very unusual for me because, I mean, I could take months or even a year to write a song. So that came very fast. When you write a song that fast, I mean, when you write a, that song, specifically that fast, you go, wait, can it be good because it came so fast? Do you have any doubt about the song because it came fast? Should a song feel like more of a no, struggle more, to you? No, more towards inclined to, this is probably good. Oh, because it just because flowed. It's, yeah, it's, you know, don't, don't touch it. It's got something that it wants to say. And, and I think that song was, it wasn't really about my life, but emotionally, I think it was autobiographical. Well, not factually, but emotionally. That song, I'm not sure, what, what year did that come I'll, out? I'll 73, I'll 74? I'll sing it later. Oh, okay, if that'd be like. great. That'd be lovely. Do you remember what year that came out? 72, 73, something like that? Maybe 74, yeah, 70. 74 sounds right, yeah. because I remember my, I was in, sitting in the car, my mom had gone to the Wind dixie grocery store, and I was listening to that song, and when she came out, she got in the front seat, and before she, she turned, you know, turned the engine, she listened to the lyric, and the lyric was, uh, uh, I know a woman became a wife. These are the very words she uses to describe her life. She says, a good day ain't got no rain, and a bad day is when I lie in bed and think of things that might have been. And my mother, went, oh. <laughs> and I looked at her and she goes, that's true. And I thought, what is her interior life like that I knew nothing about? Exactly. I'm 10 and I'm looking at her going, yeah, oh, exactly. what don't I know yeah. about her life? So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this documentary, um, your, the new documentary about your life, uh, In Restless Dreams, um, was shot while you were working on your latest album right here, Seven Psalms, which came out last year. Um, but uh, right in the middle of working on this, <laughs> right in the middle of working on this, you suffered a serious health crisis. To, uh, explain to the people what happened. Uh, well, it was not in the middle. It was uh, towards the, 
I don't know, it was after a while, but I lost the hearing in my left ear. Uh, it was a pretty precipitous decline. I mean, it happened over a couple of months, didn't come from any trauma or illness, it just happened. So I suspect that it's, uh, that it's genetic. Uh, and What does uh, that do to you as an artist? Like, does it, it was, un uh, literally unbalance you? It really, really was disconcerting and, uh, you know, it was depressing. I just didn't know what to do. Uh, uh, and so I was racing around to doctors and why, you know, why and all this. But there's, uh, it's still there. It's, it's um, but I have recently had a, a discussion with a, a group of people that I know at Stanford. Uh, they're, uh, they're scientists, and what they've said, they're, 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 uh, their group is called the Stanford Initiative to Cure Hearing Loss. And uh, what they said was that they were very close to several really big technological breakthroughs. One is uh, they can find the gene that predisposes some people to have hearing loss. I mean, not everyone's hearing loss is genetic, but they can find that and they can flip it off. They can flip that, that mutation off. So I don't know if that would have any effect on me, but if my children have this gene, that would be detected, that could be. Another thing that, they, that they've done that's, uh, that's very important is when you, Often when you lose hearing, there's the little, the inner part, the middle part of your ear is called uh, uh, the... Um, cochlea. The cochlea. And on the cochlea are these little hairs, lots and lots of little hairs, and they convey the sound to the cochlea, and the cochlea sends that on a big nerve into this part of your brain that deals with hearing. So when you have... Uh, damage to the cochlea, those, those little cilia, the hairs, they die. They, have, they haven't, haven't had until now an instrument that could actually examine. The size of a cochlea is about like maybe a quarter of an inch. So MRIs, x-rays, things like that, they're not magnified enough for them to really get an analysis. But now they have uh, a new laser-directed microscope where they can actually see these hairs. So there's going to be a, a, a great increase in their ability to analyze the damage. There's also quite a few uh, new drugs that, uh, can, uh, that can help in some cases. And the big one, which those things are, uh, those things are like within, they're gonna happen pretty soon like my lifetime, uh, more, I mean, in the next year or so, the big, big move is the stelsum research uh, where they can take stelsum from your body and redirect it at the cochlea and it will regenerate the cells that were, that that were damaged. That would, restore, that, would that would restore hearing. Did it change the way that you um, approached your, your craft? To be, be to be down a man on your, uh, in your ears. I mean, no. did it make you less of a perfectionist, or no. are you a perfectionist? Let me start no. with that. No, no, uh, you're I'm not? not. No, it's. Uh, I understand what people mean when they say that, but uh, it, there's, it's not really such a thing in music. You know, uh, it's something is either musical, and it's satisfying, or it's not satisfying in some way that's musical. It's, it's not described by perfection. Mm -hmm. no? So if I write something and I think that's good, that part's good, that part's, it, it's, it's okay. That part's, this is good, this verse is, it's good, it's all right, it's okay. Uh, what, I, what I think is the, the ear goes to the irritant. So after a while, these parts where I say they're okay, I, I say, no, I can't stand them, they're, you mm -hmm. know? So I don't think it's being a perfectionist to do that. It's like that part is not musical to you. It, ir right. it irritates you. you know, all I want to do is fix it and make it, I don't want to make it the greatest piece of, you know, eight bars that I ever wrote. I just want to make it so it doesn't bother me.
I had a, a great joke writer once said to me, gave me advice, and he said, uh, follow your discomfort. Oh, okay. And listen to it. Exactly. The joke doesn't sound right to you. You shouldn't do that. Right. Go work on it. Put it away. Or that's something like that's that. right. And did you do that on your uh, uh, monologue? Nice monologue? Yeah. No, I didn't care about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, inspir the inspiration for this album, again, which is Seven Psalms, it seems too poetic. It came to you in a dream. It, How did that it work? Did. Dreams? Well, you go to sleep. <laughs> Really? You go to sleep, and then these things come into your head. Did it literally, like, a voice say no. something in your head? It was a very, very vivid dream, and a voice said, uh, you're supposed to write, or you are writing, a piece called Seven Psalms. And it was so striking that I woke up, and I wrote it down. Seven Psalms, January 15th, 2019. And then I put a circle around the P.S. of Psalms, you know. Paul my, Simon. Right? And the next morning when I got up, I said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up Psalms. I'm not even, I think I know what it means, but I don't know. And I looked it up, and then I said, I guess I should go to the Bible. And I looked at that, and I said, I don't think I'm going to be doing this. <laughs> you're, not a fan of, you're not a fan of King David's work? In the, in the, uh, no, no, I am the 23rd Psalm, you know, they brought in a pro for that one, you know, <laughs> because that it's is good. so much better than yeah. the others. The others are like, give me the ability to smite all, boom, get those exactly. guys, and mm -hmm. that the 23rd is poetry. Um, but anyway, it didn't feel like me. But the, 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 the Psalms started to come out as guitar pieces. Uh, there were no words, so I just enjoyed playing the, the guitar pieces. Then, maybe about 10 months into it, uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with words. So I'd go and I'd, like, always between three and five, I'd go and I'd write them down, and if I thought, oh, that could be a first verse, maybe if I wrote this, the second verse, boom, everything shut down. So, so if it I, did so not come naturally, it wouldn't work at all? In this particular case, so I said, oh, great, okay, well, I'll just follow instructions, you know? It's not my idea, it's just coming to me and I'll, and I'll do it. And then the hearing thing happened and I was, you know, so disappointed until I thought, hey, maybe, you know, it wasn't supposed to be this easy all the way. Maybe this obstacle is part of your part of the process of what you're supposed to think about. It's an obstacle. It's, it's, and so, uh, because I'm thinking about songs all the time, I, I, I used it, I used it that way. Psalm, you know, we think of, you know, it sounds like song, it is a song, but it's a song to God. Yeah. Are you yourself a man of faith? I would say yes. Uh, well, let me put it another way. <clears throat> I think we're in an unbelievable paradise on Earth, and life is so mysterious, a, mis a mystery. Like in the rest of our galaxy, there's really no other life, and we don't know what's going on, so life is incredible. So I think, what a great job you did you're a god with this planet. Excellent. I'm in, <laughs> and the universe, hat, Paul Simon, hats off to you, God. Fantastic <laughs> universe. So your faith is an, an act of gratitude. And an act of gratitude. But then I think if the explanation for our creation is not there was a creator, but there's another explanation, I think I'm no less grateful and I'm no less in awe of everything, and it's not gonna change my morality. I'm not gonna think bad is good now and good is bad, because I feel when it's good and I feel when I do bad. So, in the two choices between is there a creator or is there another explanation, I like the creator story. That's where I'm at with that. You? What? You? Uh, I actually, I was uh, sort of convicted of my atheism for many years, and then I was overwhelmed um, uh, by an enormous sense of gratitude.
for the world. And that, that resonates for me because this enormous heartbreaking gratitude, even for heartbreaking things, not because the world is beautiful, but the beauty isn't necessarily I, I happy things. The joy is greater than happiness, and happiness is not the ultimate goal. Sublime is the goal. And so that feeling that even comes in grief, grief with you is an act of love. And so we can both be sad, and yet there is joy there because of our ability to share our love in that moment and heal and care for each other. That feeling that even in that there could be something beautiful led me to an enormous, overwhelming, uncontainable sense of gratitude. I understand. And it had to go someplace. Absolutely. And that led me back to my relationship with what I now call my God. Yeah, I understand completely. Yeah. The docuseries in Restless Dreams premieres Sunday on MGM+. Paul Simon, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs>